Uh, tonight we have George Ambrose, who's going to talk about growing up on the Cheer Farm uh, down in Clarendon Springs uh, back in the 40s and 50s. <clears throat> uh, some of you know George. <laughs> His reputation precedes him. That's scary. <clears throat> and <clears throat> I would say, just as you know, in Rutland, you may have seen statues going up you know, of historic figures all over, you know, the city program. I imagine someday here in Clarendon we'll have our own version of that, except they'll all be statues of George. <laughs> and each one will have one of his jokes <laughs> engraved on the bottom, you know, George's favorites. <laughs> and so wherever you go in town, you'll be able to see George. <laughs> Is that it? <laughs> I know he wanted more adjectives. <laughs> Good evening. So, Pleasure to be that, here. I leave you, George. And uh, before we get started uh, on that note that Bob was talking about statues and whatnot, I just uh, purchased a, 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 a lot in uh, the Scottsville Cemetery, and I was asking my wife if on the headstone I could have engraved in there. Nothing is written in stone, but she said that probably wouldn't be appropriate. So, so anyways, uh, again, before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge uh, uh, a fellow that I know, Phil, over here on the camera. And, and some years ago now, because of COVID, uh, he had talked to me about coming and making a presentation such as we're doing tonight. And I said, sure. And he had a whole list of rules that he wanted to go over with me back then. And he hasn't refreshed my memory on them, so I may violate some of the rules. So before we start, I, I apologize, Phil. Now we're gonna be talking a little bit about uh, the farm I grew up on as a kid that was started by my grandfather, uh, Frank Tier, in uh, 1905, as according to my research assistant, uh, Mr. Underhill. And anyways, uh, as I'm talking about this uh, fellow, that he was a farmer, I just wanted to share with Phil that, uh, you know, that he was a farmer that was truly outstanding in his field. <laughs> that was for Phil's benefit. Anyways, the other person I, I'm glad to see here is a fellow by the name of Dave Potter. Raise your hand, Dave. <laughs> Now Dave and I were in high school together some years back, and of course he was a junior classman, and, and I let I forgave him for that. And we have I have another gentleman that I've gotten to know recently uh, back there, Kevin Peck. You can, yeah, there you go. Now I ran into Kevin many years ago at Stafford, and uh, he and his son were up there doing a welding class, and now Kevin is one of the uh, listers in the group. Getting back to the topic of my conversation, which is life on the tear farm, I, I need to sort of share with you a little background about myself and how I ended up being there, I guess, would be handy. Uh, my uh, my f mom's uh, family, my mom was a tear. There were two, two girls and five guys, five boys, and the youngest one was born in 1927, and my grandfather died in 1926, so apparently uh, he never got to meet his dad. Uh, so one of the things that I wanted to share with you tonight is on the Tear Farm now, there's a family by the name of Lanfear, I don't know who may know them, but uh, there's a, the young Lanfear is uh, making maple syrup. And last time I talked with him was, I don't know, probably a year and a half, two years ago, he was tapping about 30,000. I'm not sure what he's doing now, but do you have any idea, Dave? Yeah, but I know he's got a pretty big operation. And the reason that I thought that was uh, worth mentioning is that Bob found a newspaper article about my grandfather, who in the teens, I forget what year it was, but in the late teens, uh, had bought some uh, brand new sugaring equipment along with 3,500 buckets. And he even bought several hundred feet, 300 to 500 feet of tube, uh, no, excuse me, of pipe so that he could run sap downhill to the sugar house. 
Now this wasn't the tubing that we see today. This was galvanized tubes about two, two and a half inches in diameter that were tapered and they would put the sections together. Did you have that on your farm? Do you remember, Dave? There might have been small sections of it. Yeah. Nothing big like that. Well, this one uh, across from where the sugar house, uh, where well, you can drive up there and see where it was, uh, there was a very steep hill and they had quite a few taps there. And they would, of course, had what they called dumping stations, and they would dump the sap in there. And in this newspaper article, it made mention that uh, Frank Tier uh, was one of the biggest producers in Rutland County at that time, and uh, tapped 3,500 3, uh, taps. And uh, I thought that was neat that now that farm is being used for the same purpose, even on a bigger scale. So anyways, how I came to end up on the farm uh, my mom and dad got married, I don't know when, uh, but somewhere after I was born, they got divorced, which was unheard of in those days. This was in the 40s, of course, I was born in 41. And uh, apparently mom and, and I moved back to the family farm on the Tear Road. Of course, it wasn't named the Tear Road at that time. I don't know when the name came into being. Uh, I left the area in the uh, 60s, early 60s, and didn't move back to Vermont until 77 to Randolph, and then moved back here. Uh, 91, I guess I was back in this area. Anyways, uh, so that's where I was as a youngster. And I thought that I would share with you some of the things that I thought was normal because I grew up with them, that as I got older realized, hmm, this is unusual. For example, I never knew such a thing as pizza existed until I ended up in Rutland High School. So that was kind of a, a, an eye-opener. But uh, when my grandfather bought the farm, it comprised 40, I know, 50 acres, what Bob tells me, and it was probably located right to the, as you go up to the top of the tier road before you take a sharp uh, right, I think it was the uh, place to the left is where the farmhouse was, and I suspect the 50 acres were around there. As the years progressed, when after my grandfather died, my older uncle, Percy, uh, took over the farm. And uh, at one point, Bob tells me it had how many? 164. Acres, which is pretty good size. And I got very familiar with that farm lands as it, uh, time progressed. Uh, the farmhouse, I suspect, was the one that, one that my grandfather bought that I was in as a kid. And I'm trying to recall what the size might be. Uh, and, and I've dragged my brains, but I, I can't come up with a figure that I'm happy with. But I'll share with you what I know. I know that it was torn down here a few years ago by the uh, lamb fears because it was old. The farmhouse consisted on the first floor of a huge kitchen. It was probably about half of the first floor. Everything happened in the kitchen. And then the other part of the first floor consisted of a living room or a parlor. And there was a bed, uh, large bedroom and a small bedroom there as well. Um, in the upper story, uh, the second floor had three, I guess, three and a half bedrooms, I guess you would uh, say, as, as I think about it. And that was the makeup of it. Now behind, away from the front door, which is uh, the front door face to the east, uh, was a shed uh, building structure that was where the firewood was kept. And in the back of that shed, there was a two-holer still there when I was a kid. And apparently, uh, that was a, a necessary element for the house. Um, I, I don't know when they had indoor plumbing. It was there, I remember it as a kid. And I think that it was, they stole some part of the kitchen out and made a room where they had a bathroom with a tub and a sink and, and a uh, john as well. And so that was what the makeup of the house. Now around the front of the house in on the south side there was a enclosed porch that had uh, windows and whatnot that my grandmother used to love to be there uh, as many uh, days as she could and she would <laughs> she was an incredible lady um, 
one of the, her things was to hook rugs, and she would make rugs using the uh, burlap grain bags would be the foundation for the rugs that she would hook. And she would also crochet. And her crochet, uh, she would crochet with string versus yarn. And she would uh, use the string that was holding the grain bags together. And people that were unloading the grain bags, because that at the time they came in grain bags versus in bulk, uh, you would pull a string and you'd get two pieces off the top of each bag. And we were responsible for winding it up. And she would end up with several large balls of this twine or string, whatever you want to call it, that my grandmother would make uh, all kinds of things with. And I meant to bring one of the items with me tonight, and of course I, being old and forgetful, walked right out of the house and forgot it. When I was a teenager, she made me a quilt that would fit a regular full-size bed out of this grain bag string, and I still have that today. And it's one of my prized possessions. Uh, so that was my grandma. Now, when I was uh, probably five, six, seven, I remember fairly clearly, my grandmother kept hens. And she had a very large flock of hens. And I remember going out to the hen house with her to collect eggs, which I, as I recall, was a big event in my life, I guess. And she would bring them back into the house and would inspect them and do the, what they call it, candling, is that it, or something of that nature, and pack them. And what she would do is, when she had 12 dozen eggs, they would go to Rutland, and they would end up at the IGA grocery store. And the IGA grocery store used to be located in the building that is across Baxter Street from the washbuckler, the laundromat. I, do you remember that store, Dave? I suspect you might. Uh, anybody else here that might? Anyways, so that was one of the, the chores that uh, my grandmother did that I, I helped her with. Now, the, as I said, everything happened in the, in the kitchen. And, on, and it was a rectangle, fairly long uh, room. And in one end of the rectangle, the narrow end, uh, would be a wood stove. A wood stove that my grandmother insisted that was everything, or the only thing she used. Now also, when I was a kid sitting in that kitchen, on uh, one of the longer walls was an old-fashioned gas stove. One that uh, was kind of enameled, green they were, and uh, had legs not in the closure like you see today. And I guess, and it wasn't hooked up to anything, and my grandmother apparently came in as a treat for her, and she absolutely refused it, and she was not, that was not going to be used in her kitchen. So the wood stove is what did everything. And on that wood stove was what they called a reservoir that had water in it that was warm or hot, depending on how much fire they had going in the stove. And behind that stove, or beside that stove, uh, was a little curtained off place. It was, whoops, I screwed up your mic here. So, am I still? Are we in business? Yeah. Okay. So, in that uh, space was an old fashioned galvanized tub. Uh, I can't remember, probably five feet long or so, something in that neighborhood. And as a youngster, I, can re I got quite acquainted with that tub because I would be put back there, and, and I'm, again, four, five, six, somewhere in there, and that's where I got a bath versus using the bathroom because I don't know why, but that's where it happened. And they would pour in the hot water. Now, somewhere along as a kid, they got a hot water heater, electric one, and that was in the kitchen and uh, piped over to the sink so that they had uh, more convenient hot water. Now, <clears throat> one, of, one of my fondest memories is in the morning we'd you know, get, uh, get up and Grandma would always have a fresh batch of biscuits every single day. And she would also have uh, coffee on the stove and uh, so that was always guaranteed to be there. Now, pot, uh, now breakfast generally consisted of generally some eggs, quite often would be 
one of my favorite things, which is absolutely wonderful for you, fried salt pork. And I, I grew up on fried salt pork and, and uh, fried uh, gravy made with it on potatoes. is one of the best tasting things you can ever have. And I see Kevin shared the same experience with me. That's why I fell in love with it. Yeah. <laughs> and of course, uh, it's frowned on by all of the dietitians today. So anyways, uh, breakfast would generally be about 9 o'clock in the morning because the first thing you got up and started chores. Probably, I would, as I recall, 5.30, 6 o'clock would be you know, the time you'd be up and headed for the barn to get the chores for the day done and get the milking done. And, and of course, it was, uh, the milking would be finished and the uh, milking utensils would be washed and cleaned before you went into breakfast. So I don't know if that's the experience you had, Dave, but yes. and so uh, and after breakfast, uh, depending on the time of year, it would be discussed what was going to go, go on that day. And summertime, of course, it was probably haying or planting or harvesting hay or corn or whatever. Now, uh, so that always took a few minutes of discussion. And my uncle, uh, at the time that was running the farm, who was Percy Tier, was a select man here in Clarendon from uh, somewhere in the 40s to the 60s. Uh, he died somewhere around 64, 65, if, uh, if I cor correctly recall. Uh, and <clears throat> so after the discussion, uh, we would disperse to uh, do these chores. Sometimes I was kept when I was younger, kept there to help whatever was going on in the house. Now, one of my favorite days, days in the house was wash day, when the clothes got washed. Out on this porch that I told you about, on the side door, out of the kitchen, there was an old-fashioned ringer washer that, as far as I know, was used right up until the day my uh, grandmother died. And uh, I can't remember, she died 62, maybe 63. She got to hold my oldest son before, before she passed away, which I thought was kind of nice. Anyways, in the house would come this ringer washer, and it would be set right near the sink, which was on the other end from the stove. There was a lot of going back and forth, as I recall. And not only would the washing machine come in, but there would be this wooden um, stand or table or bench, whatever you want to call it, would come in too. And on this bench would be two round galvanized tubs, probably uh, two and a half, three feet in diameter, something like that. And they would be filled with water. And then the clothes would go into the washing machine and it had an old fashioned agitator in soap and they would get washed. They would fed through the ringer into tub number one. And they, this ringer would swivel and it would get rinsed, and then they would swivel it around, and it would go into tub number two to get rinsed again before it was uh, finally uh, went through the ringer to go to be hung outside on the clothesline. And in the winter, the clothesline was on this closed-in porch, which uh, when I had cousins come to visit, uh, we, we used to have a lot of fun with the clothesline on the porch, but we would tie all kinds of things up. So that would be wash days, which was one of my favorite times. Now, the heat for the house was down in the cellar. It was a huge old furnace, and uh, they would put pretty good sized pieces of wood or chunks of wood into this furnace uh, a couple, three times a day. And the heat would come up through uh, the kitchen floor, and there was a register there that you could look down in and see the top of the furnace. <coughs> and, <coughs> excuse me, I would say it must have been probably two and a half, three feet square. And that's what the, was the only heat in the house other than the wood stove that my grandmother cooked on. No heat upstairs, of course. There were, in each room there were these little vents, I guess you'd call them, that would go up to the second floor. So there was a little heat that got up there. Uh, and the stairs going upstairs were similar to what you find in older houses quite frequently. Very steep, very narrow treads. Uh, generally, uh, there was no handrail or anything. And uh, that's what you used to get upstairs. 
Now, the reason I mentioned the stairs because I spent a lot of time on the very first step because there was a door going upstairs and the door would close to not let any excess heat get out, of course. And the door would go over the top of this first step. And that's where I would sit most of the time as a kid. And uh, I can remember it very well. The other thing that was in the kitchen was a radio that was a cabinet radio that was, I don't know, four or five feet high, four feet high, I guess, that uh, they would use to hear the news. And I can remember being told as a young kid that that is uh, Roosevelt speaking on the radio. This was in the 40s, of course. And I had to be really young because I can't remember what year he died. But it was in the 40s, if I remember correctly, when Truman took over. 45. What's that? 40, April 12, 45. Yeah, that sounds about right. So I've been about four years old. I don't remember it, but I remember being told or was told that in the, in the future or you know, as years went on. But the thing about this radio, I remember quite clearly because many uh, times we would be there and uh, after supper or maybe before supper and the radio would be on to try to catch the news. And I remember very clearly the people at the time, the people in the house was uh, my Uncle Percy, Uncle Raymond, and neither one of those gentlemen ever got married. And then I had uh, Uncle John, who was the youngest one, who did get married, uh, and I remember going to the wedding my mom and my grandmother and, and myself. And that would be the uh, people normally at the, at the house. And the adults uh, would sit there listening to the radio and they would be looking intently at this cabinet radio while the news was on. And why I mentioned that is some years later, uh, in the 50s, maybe 51, 52, somewhere in there, they got a TV set with an antenna and they could get one channel from Schenectady and they would go in there sometimes oh my grandmother allowed the news to be on the TV and one other show and that was the Ed Sullivan show and that was it it's the only time the TV was on and so they would go in particularly to watch the Ed Sullivan show and in the summertime you'd be out working and quite often you would miss it because you were still haying or whatever but in the summertime they would be there uh, in the living room parlor watching the TV and then a lot of them would fall asleep. Now when the radio is on I don't ever remember anybody falling asleep but they would be staring at the radio so I never quite figured that one out. Uh, anyways uh, back to the back to the kitchen. Uh, the kitchen table was a round table uh, as I recall best I can it was probably could have been at least six feet in diameter. Uh, might have been more, I don't know. And they had these old-fashioned kitchen chairs that you see sometimes when you go to an estate sale that have uh, a curved back and uh, they're quite large and I suspect that they were there when the, my uncle, the last uncle that lived there, got rid of the farm. And we would sit around this round table to have our meals. And the thing that I often remember about this uh, table was in the on the table was this brown earthenware pitcher about this big that was always full of maple syrup summer or winter and I now have that pitcher in my house it was one of my fondest memories and when my grandmother was sick and, and, and she insisted that I take it because she knew that I was fascinated by that brown pitcher so anyways uh, as we would sit around the table uh, eating and talking, uh, quite often uh, the noontime meal, which was in the summertime particularly, might be around 1.30, 2 o'clock because you were cutting hay or you were doing such things as needed to be done in the morning. And we would also, after uh, lunch, uh, the guys, and as I got older, I was included, would go out somewhere and generally around where we had an equipment shed uh, on the property that was just as you turned on to the property from uh, Tier Road, the equipment shed was, it was right there. And uh, we, the folks would gather around and decide what to, what to do for the rest of the day in terms of what hay needed to be tedded or whatever. And that was uh, always an enjoyable time because people that knew my uncle as a selectman quite often would show up at that time period because they knew what his routine was to talk about whatever they wanted to talk about. Now we had neighbors 
one of the neighbors were what we called summer people that lived on the road, the tier road that goes towards Ira. I don't know how many are familiar with that, but you go out there quite a ways and it takes a sharp turn to the left to head down towards the road 133 to Ira. And right there, there was a farmhouse that I, was bought by somebody from, I don't know, New York somewhere. I don't have a good memory of that. But they would come up to visit and they would stop in at the farm, of course, and to find out what was going on, I guess, in the neighborhood. So that was one uh, house with neighbors. And down at the bottom of Tier Road, where Rocker Mountain is, was the other neighbor, which was uh, the road commissioner at the time. Uh, oh, gosh. Carl Lanfear. Yes, Carl Lanfear. And not only was that where he lived, it, that's where the town equipment was generally housed at that time. And <clears throat> I don't know how many have ever been up Tier Road, up the hill. Well, as a kid, I used to, the mailbox was down on Walker Mountain at the corner. And as a kid, I would, um, when I say kid, probably in my nine, ten year old uh, time period, would walk down to get the mail. And that was quite a treat because I could lollygag on the way back. And down there, of course, across, kitty corner across from there was uh, that store that burned down here a few years ago, which was another favorite place because they always had penny candy. <laughs> Not anymore. So that's kind of some of the life of, of me being on the farm. Now, one of the things that uh, happened was my mother attended uh, a, a, a hospital nursing program where she was trained in nursing. And uh, what she did uh, when I was a youngster, as near as I can figure out what happened, I never talked to, one of the things I made a mistake on is never talking to these adults that surrounded me to find out a lot of stuff. Anyways, uh, I think what she did was have her name into many, with many doctors, and she would get a call from somebody that's had a mother home from the hospital that needed care for a while to recover from an operation, or somebody was, uh, on their last days and she would go to help uh, that process uh, take place. And when I, I would often, uh, depending on the family, if they had a large house and lots of resources, I would go with her. And as a result of that, uh, I ended up probably attending eight or nine different elementary schools to the best of my memory. And which I, I only remember one year where I was at the same school for the whole school year until I got to junior high and high school which was kind of interesting. So sometimes I would be there with, when I was really young with my grandmother while she was off doing this nursing work. Um, and that's when I would collect the eggs and things of that nature. Now, uh, I guess some of the uh, farming part of it, when I first became aware of uh, the stuff that was going on outside the building, one of the first things that I ended up uh, being able to experience was being taken to their sugar house. And I probably was, I can remember it, so I was five, I guess people remember at that age. And they would take me to their sugar house and I would uh, sit on the, there was a shelf on the, on the wall, I would sit up there and watch the sap boiling. And they would bring out an egg and boil it in a sap and then they would let it cool and they'd crack it and I, I would get to eat the egg, which I thought was quite a deal. So that was one of my first memories. Now as I got older and I helped to hang these 3,500 buckets that uh, my grandfather bought and install this pipeline, now the pipe went over the top of the road, high enough so that cars could get underneath it into the sugar house. Now the sugar house was torn down here two or three years ago, I guess, and uh, the Lanfear boy has built another facility uh, near where the, uh, I guess where the old farmhouse was, but I'm not sure of that. I, I have a hard time going up there because it's out of the family and I don't feel comfortable, but you know. Um, and that was, oh, there was one other thing I was going to mention. Going to the north from where the farmhouse was, halfway between that farmhouse and this sharp corner going to Ira, there were two buildings that when I was a kid that was apparently another small farm. And I guess it's right now there's some houses, and I think there's a house where that farm, and, uh, that barn and that house were. And when I was a kid, 
uh, we used the house to store hay in, in the barn, which I think held probably a dozen animals. We would carry, uh, we'd have uh, young stock up there to, you know, to age and get to the point where they could be put to work. And I, I remember when that house was empty before we filled it with hay, being there to, uh, and I would play in the kitchen that had an old fashioned hand pump on the sink with a soapstone sink. I don't know whatever happened to it because I, I left the area in, in the early 60s, about 63, I guess, something like that. So that's another piece of uh, history that is gone, whatever. I don't know if you could ever find anything in your research about it, but it was one of those small farms that we had a lot of, I guess, in town. And uh, the other thing that amazed me when I came back to this area was the number of farms that are not here, that was here as a kid. Uh, just, just find that amazing. And one of the farms that I w ended up going to visit a lot was the Chapman farm. And a fellow by the name of Chipper Chapman that ran it at the time. And he was a very interesting gentleman. Uh, Dave, you must have known him. And I don't know about you two over there, or you might have. But anyways, uh, that was a little larger farm than, uh, than in terms of the barn than what we had. And near as I can recall, I don't know, we had, we had to milk somewhere along 50, 60, 70 maybe, there we had in the old barn, something of that nature. And there were quite a few animals, you know, in various stages of, of production, of course. One of the jobs I ended up having to struggle with is trying to feed the damn calves. And if anybody's had that experience, you may have, uh, I'm looking at, uh, I'm sorry, I've got your first names gone again. Thank you. Because that was quite an experience trying to get a calf to drink out of a pail. You'd end up with, quite often with milk all over you. Anyways, uh, other than the, that, if anybody's got some questions, I'll happy to try and answer them. I've always got an answer, but whether it matches up with a question might be a problem. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Yes. The road that went by the farm yes. and exited out just north of the Victories, was that ever open? When you were Not to my knowledge, no. Uh, I do remember them talking about that road. Uh, and there seemed to me that there was another kind of a pathway that went out towards T uh, Timoth over through, uh, what's the name of the people that are up there on the top of Higher Road? Uh, uh, Scribbler. But I don't know if that was ever a road or just something that they did between farms. And then, and then the other question is, uh, there used to be an old building right on the inside of that sharp turn by the farm. Is that a sugar house down in there? Uh, which side of the road are you talking? If you're going up the hill from after collecting the mail. Yeah. And uh, if you turn right, it's right in that. That was the sugar house. Yeah, and that, the, the Landfear boy, I guess, he used it a couple of times until he decided to go bigger. And he tore it down, but yeah. And as far as I know, the equipment and the, and the sugar house and everything, that when I was doing that in the late 50s and early 60s, it was the same that my grandfather bought, bought, bought back in the teens. And when we sugared, it was always, well, when I first started helping and working with them, it was always with horses. And then somewhere in the 50s, they bought a John Deere little uh, bulldozer that they had, a little two-cylinder two bulldozer that would go just about anywhere. And that's what they used to collect sap with at that time. And <clears throat> as far as I know, they were, I don't know what happened after my older uncle, Percy, died, whether or not Ray kept up the sugaring or not. But as far as I know, they never got into using the, the lines, but I may be wrong on that. But the other thing, I, I'm glad you asked that question. Down below where the barn was, heading towards, down the hill towards Walker Mountain Road, uh, behind the barn there was a lot of woods. And there was a little stream in there that was fed by a spring or something, I would guess. And partly down that uh, stream was a structure that was there as a kid that I used to get out and go play in. And it was a cement structure and the it was wood and a roof, and it was still kind of, it was kind of falling down when I was there, but it was still solid enough so that I was safe. 
and inside they had this cement uh, structure so that the water would run through it and that was their refrigeration I guess back in the I don't know when the farm started did you find any notion as to when it started before my uh, grandfather bought it no so that's what they used for refrigeration now I know my grandfather made cheese and butter because the uh, uh, separator and all the equipment was still there in, in the uh, milk house that's another thing when we'd milk at that time when I first was able to help my job was to carry the pails of milk from the barn to the, sh to the milk house and they were just open pails and I would carry them up to the uh, milk house where we'd have the milk cans with a strainer in it and we would dump the milk in to strain it. Now in the summertime I used to get a kick out of it because there would be a gazillion flies in the strainer that you know because they were, they were there, it was uh, pasteurized later nobody worried about it. And then after the milk cans were filled, you'd put the cover on them, and you had to go up two little steps to get above the uh, cooler that they had that was filled with water, and you would set these uh, milk cans down into the water to keep them cool. Now, it had to have been somewhere in the early f or mid-50s when they got the bulk tank in and put the pipeline up. You know, that sort of took away my job. I was disappointed, terribly disappointed. But anyways, uh, that, that's part of it. And as I said, when I first was there, they were still farming with horses. And they, and they uh, would pick up, the hay was loose. They had what's called a hay loader, dragged behind the wagon. I don't know if Potter remembers those. And then they would have a thing called a dump rake, and they had a side delivery rake. And on the side delivery rake, would rake it up into windrows so that you could go along with this hay loader and get the loose hay up onto the wagon. Now when they were done with that, they had this dump rake that you would go around and get what was called the scatterings and make sure you didn't waste any of the hay. So then it would come back to the barn and in the barn they would have a hay fork that would come down to this wagon and grab a bunch of hay and they had a horse that would pull the uh, fork up and then would long tracks to dump it into the hay, mow in the hay mound in, in the barn. The job that I had when I was really little was I would sit on this horse and go back and forth with the horse. The other thing that strikes me as a neat memory is when they harvested corn, when they first ha I first had memories of it, they had a machine that would cut and bundle the corn and lay it on the ground. And then we would go back later and pick it up on a wagon and go to the silo where they had a, 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 a auger that would feed it into a chopper and blow it into the silo. And the first tractor that I remember having was a small John Deere tractor that had a, uh, a drum on it that run a belt, flat belt, to this chopper that, I don't know, must have been 10 feet long or so. Do you remember that kind of thing, Dave? And that would run that machine and it would unload from the wagon these bundles of corn to go through that up into the silo. So anyways, now that you got me off on a tangent, Phil, it's all your fault. Now there was another road that would cross in, above that building you're talking about and go up a hill and it would be headed down towards... Um, Weavers. Yes. And I was told that was a road at one time. So that's all I know about it. And you see, well, I don't know if you do anymore, but the last time I was up there was in the 60s. You could see, see traces of it. It seems it, like the road that we first talked about went by the farm and came down out on the walk around road uh, north of yep. Victories. Yep. And the other one was just an extension of the higher road that just continued over the mountain. Could very well have been. You know, it's fascinating that we don't have enough evidence to find that out for sure because I find it very interesting. Anyways, any questions? I'm done. Yes, sir. I've got a couple. Um, the 12 dozen eggs that went to Baxter Street. Yeah. What happened to those? Were they sold? Yes. Were they traded for groceries? No, they was, they were, they, she would get money and take them away. Sometimes she would buy me a treat if I was with her. but And she didn't drive, so one of the... One of the uh, uh, sons or my uncles would have to drive her when that happened. So that was a big event. I think about that often as a kid. If we ended up in Rutland once a, once a, 
uh, every two weeks or once a month was a rare occasion. Now I end up in Rutland sometimes twice a day for Clarendon. Uh, horses at first, uh, and that's my earliest memories. We had two sets of uh, farm horses, and they were always, my older uncle always had uh, a horse or two in training to take over that. But of course, when tractors came in, it, they still had, I think they still kept a team for the sugaring operation for quite a while. But uh, yeah. There was a book that I ended up having in my hands, and I don't know how, called Peck's Bad Boy. Has anybody ever heard of it or seen it? It was written by a, a, a Chicago uh, paper editor back in the uh, 1800s, and it was all about this young lad, uh, about probably 12, getting into mischief. And generally his father ended up the butt of all of his practical jokes. Well, I figured out how to read that thing because it amused me, and that's what developed my reading for a job in Randolph, Vermont, to teach in a tech school like Stafford, and uh, they needed somebody to teach machining. So I applied and was interviewed, and they hired me, and I started working there in 1977. And when, <laughs> this will dove into what you heard earlier, Kevin. So when I was there as a teacher, they hired me, and here's their salary, and then they showed me this chart that each year I was there, my salary would go up, and if I got more education, my salary would also go up. So I said, well, this is a good deal. So I applied to UVM, and I went to UVM uh, for, I think, one, two, three, four, well, three and a half semesters, and ended up with a bachelor's degree in technical uh, education over there where they had the technical department where they had the windmill at one time. And that's that's how I got uh, my first bachelor's degree, a bachelor in science, and uh, got an increase in, in pay. Well, one of the things that I learned doing this process in Massachusetts when I was at Northeastern and then later at UVM is that I enjoyed being a student. In fact, I'd be a student today if they'd pay me for it because I really enjoyed doing that. And I was doing quite well at. I graduated uh, UVM in the uh, the uh, agricultural group of people, the college, and I was seven out of 212 in terms of the grade point average, which I was quite proud of. And so I finished that and went back to teaching in Randolph. I was teaching there. I was going to school nights, weekends, summers to do to do that. <coughs> and. UVM professors came down from Waterman Education Department and were talking to us that, you know, you know, it'd be nice to get a master's degree and we'll have it where you can get to it conveniently. So I enrolled in one and I graduated that in two years um, and had a, a master's degree in curriculum and instruction with an emphasis on reading instruction. If you remember, I had struggled as a, as a youngster with reading. And I was able to make use of that. I worked for VTC in Randolph teaching a course in technical reading for a couple of years. So that was kind of a fun thing. Um, and when I finished that, it was in the 80s somewhere, I can't remember just where, uh, a friend of mine that I worked with, the name of Don Grout, who passed away some years ago, he taught uh, computer technology at the same time. We became very good friends. And he, uh, had, he taught math in West Rutland before coming to uh, Randolph to teach uh, the computer science. And he had a bachelor's degree and a master's degree from UVM earlier in his, his uh, lifetime. And so one day, we used to have lunch together just about every day. One day he said, George, he says, I'm going to go to Vanderbilt and get a doctorate. I said, really? And he said, here, he showed me a brochure and I read it over and I said, well, that'd be kind of fun. So I enrolled and was accepted. And you, again, you had a, like, when you go to college, you take the SATs. When you go to graduate school, you have what they call graduate, uh, graduate record examinations. And I did that for the master's degree and did okay. 
Well, for the, uh, ma uh, for the doctorate, you had a choice between that and what they called Miller analogies. And so that's the one I took because that always intrigued me. That's where you have a, uh, like a frog with two legs and a half an ear, and how does it relate to this uh, dog over here, that kind of thing. And so that's how that happened. And they flew uh, professors out to a college in New Hampshire where we attended college uh, classes every weekend for th almost three years. And we had to go to Nashville each summer and study on campus, and that's how I got that. And I pursued that for one reason only, just to prove to myself that I could do it. I did make use of it later on as, as time went on. But So, did that answer your question, Dave? Yeah. Did, how many are asleep? Hands, please. I'm done. Anything else? Keeping going. I know the roads were different back in the 40s and 50s. Yes. Especially the rural roads that yes. they are today. Yes. Do you want to comment a little on that? Well, I can remember Tear Road getting washed out so we didn't, couldn't use it for sometimes a couple of days. And I remember them dumping milk because they, they couldn't get it out to be refrigerated. And. Uh, yeah, you know, I remember walking down at one time, and it was washed out, so there was huge boulders that you could see where the road used to be. And well, I can tell you a story. It's not true, but I, I like the story. Uh, my uncle and I were down at the mailbox one day, and uh, near Walker Mountain, and we happened to be looking down the road towards where the store was, and we noticed this round thing in the middle of the road. And as we studied it, we realized it was moving, and it was moving toward us. So we stood there and watched it for a while, and we realized that it was a hat, and one of these old-fashioned round kind of hats moving closer to us. And not only was there a hat, there was a head under the hat getting closer to us every minute. And as we get up, got closer, we realized that it was one of the ministers that would come around visiting from Rutland City. His name was Brown. And my uncle, being the polite man that he was, said, uh, uh, Morning, uh, Reverend Brown, how are you? And he said, Fine. And my uncle, of course, making conversation, said, Gee, it's a mite muddy today, isn't it, on the road? And the Reverend, good Reverend, said, Well, my horse sure thinks so. <laughs> so there you go. But like the East Clarendon Road, part of it was dirt road for many years back then. Down past where uh, Frankenwich there it lives, it was all dirt by that farm, or the railroad tracks were. Anything else, Dave? I grew up on that road, and that was dusty, and yes. that street, everything in our house was hollow. Yes. And it was dusty. Yep. And I never heard my mother swear, except for those times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That, that was a very dirt road. Yep. That was quite a while ago. Anything else? I'm sorry, I hope I haven't bored you too badly. It's all Phil's fault. Blame him. George, I, yes. I don't know what, I, I never knew what the connection was. Of course, my, family, my father's roots and everything on school, I'll still go to the mess and something. I remember in the early 60s, yep. my dad came to work. You know, every year or so, we would go to the sugar house. Yep. I always, to this day, you know, that sugar house that Phil mentioned, down, it's down over the bank in the yep. hole. Yep. Basically in the hole. Yep. And tucked in, you know, it's got the road, it's got a brook. Yep. A brook on the right. That's right. And this sugar house was tucked down in yes. the hole. So I remember, I never, we never knew what it was. I mean, other than a pipe, I, I imagine it was, but I never knew it was a metal pipe. But I remember That's what it was. That's what it was. Yeah. Steep, steep yeah, bank. yeah. I mean, it's, it's steep. Yeah, that was the that was the pipe I was talking about. I remember the pipe across the road. Yeah. And you look down the and yeah. Seeing it there, you had that sharp bend just above the shelf. Yes, house. yes. And right there, the pipe mm -hmm. comes down across. Well, that's why they built it there, is for to get the effect of the gravity, I, yeah. I guess. Yeah, you can see that, that structure, you know, fairly recently, it was just kind of falling down. Right. Yeah. You know, the woods there. <laughs> And you see where the road wash out. Yeah. It was good July, August thunderstorms. Oh gosh, yes. You know, 
big road right on the lawyer. Yeah. Yep. Now the original road used to travel to the east of that sugar house and then up the hill and then straight on the original road. Yeah, I think that is correct. Yeah, for my uh, for money though. If, if you're up in that area, uh, headed toward the sharp turn. Yep. Right where that road jags a little bit is bringing it back onto where the original road. Yep. Yeah. Yep. I believe you're right. So I was wondering if that sugar house was placed there because at one time it might be next to the right next to the road that used to be there. I, it could very well be. I'm, I, I can't remember for sure. Well, I certainly don't remember. I'm a little angry. Did you have large gardens? <laughs> that was one of the things that my grandma would do, and I'd be out there as a little one, and, and uh, I remember doing potatoes. Oh my God. <laughs> Planting potatoes. She had an asparagus bed, and I remember harvesting the asparagus, and uh, yeah, she would she would have quite a vegetable garden going always. And she probably canned and everything. Oh, I yes, I like oh the other thing that happened I I was get I was fairly old and I had to have been fourteen fifteen when they got a chest freezer <laughs> and she could freeze stuff and that had to have been like fifty what I don't know six somewhere in there I don't know but and you probably slaughtered on the farm. I don't remember too much of that, but yeah, I mean, uh, I, don't, I don't remember that a lot, which is because when I moved back to Randolph, I grew my own beef and pork and stuff, but I, I knew that they did process stuff in the farm, but right. I, I probably wasn't off doing other chores or something. I don't remember much of it happening. It may have, but I've just forgotten. Mm -hmm. They canned the meat yep. before the freezer days. Yep. They yep. canned the meat, and they also... They had dried beef. Yes. They would pickle it. Yep. In a brine, and then pull it out and dry it in the kitchen. Yeah. She was the all-purpose room. Well, we used to have these large. You cut off little slices of it. It was really tasty, very salty. Like. Yeah. They wouldn't recommend it today. But. They used to have these large, like crocks in the cellar that yeah. they had. They put preserved stuff in. It was a way of preserving meat. Yeah. Exactly. Because it didn't, they had, I don't know when, I suspect it was around the same time, but Power came to the Potter Farm on the West Timber Road in 1943. Yep. So before that, they were off the grid. And, yep. Uh, you know, you have to live differently. Well, I remember the lamps were still in the farmhouse, the, the kerosene, and the uh, kerosene lamps that were yeah. still on the brackets. Yeah. And oh, and I loved the telephone. It was a wooden structure on the wall with a mouthpiece and a, and a piece put up to your ear. And, yeah, and, and you'd... How uh, many people on the party line? About if I remember eight, right, there was eight folks on yeah. that party line. And, and they could hear what you're talking about. Oh, of course. That's how you kept up with the gossip, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Well, George, we thank you. You know, Dr. Ambrose. Do I get a, do I get a cookie now? Well, I, I would say George is very humble. He doesn't ever have us, you know, doesn't tell people he's got a PhD. Uh, so we don't tend to call him a doctor. You better not. He comes into the town hall, we just kind of bow once and you're all set. <laughs> 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 yeah. Um, no, I, I mean, that was, again, it was for my own satisfaction of doing it, and I did make use of it, so. Signing off, over and out. Thanks, George. Thank you. Yeah.